you know, we make a lot of statements. Neil's already used the word, but Jesus made a lot of statements. But we make a, a lot of statements in life. And uh, I've always been fascinated by statements. Obviously, there's some good ones and not so good ones. But even in the singing that we do, you know, we sang this morning, you're the reason we came to encounter your love. Your love surrounds us. And, you know, sometimes in our mind we can think that's fairly cushy. But the Bible says perfect love casts fear out. be very powerful. The love of God coming around about us is a very powerful thing. It can deal with all sorts of issues. But uh, a statement I came across simply says, life begins at the end of your comfort zone. That's sort of something to think about, isn't it? Life begins at the end of your comfort zone. And that uh, we all got one of those. But the one that I like the best, I guess, that I've sort of hung on to over a number of years, not negatively, is simply that life is what happens when you've got other things planned. Found that. Found that to be very, very true. Life happens. We might plan all sorts of things, but life happens. And uh, the good thing about that is I obviously want to speak about God's plan. I mean, that's the important part. Uh, today, you know, we've got Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, and well, I'm not on any of them. And, uh, but I do sort of see them on the computer at times, and they've either got a, a like or dislike. You know. that, that's it. It's either good or bad. So we live in a world where there's a lot of likes and there's a lot of dislikes. And uh, one of my dislikes in a statement that I've heard on different occasions when somebody's really going through tough stuff and somebody else says wonderfully, build a bridge and get over it. I hate that statement. Now, I don't use the word hate much. I hate that. God never, ever said anything like that, ever. Just build a bridge and get over it. He told us really to encourage one another, to work with one another. Um, I want to just read something briefly before. My message is really about invitations and instructions because there's a lot of them in the book. But that's what I'm sharing about. But, you know, we're, we're all preachers to a degree. And I heard someone say a long, long time ago, you're the most important preacher you'll ever hear because what you speak to yourself is really what you're going to live out. And uh, this really came from two preachers that have preached for decades. They're both authors. And been asked the question a number of times, and I guess some of us have been asked this question, why do you keep doing it? Very interesting statement. But one of these guys answered it, and he answered it this way. The answer to that question is probably true for all of us. Jesus is the answer. He's the reason, the motivation, the heart. The light that blazes like a floodlight or flickers like a birthday cake candle in the breeze, but is never actually extinguished. It's my yearning for him, my deep down wish that all should be well between us, that fuels my desire to continue communicating and encouraging and challenging and making space for those who are on the same strange journey as me. It is, I hope, a reflection of his frequently expressed overwhelming desire that we should look after each other. And I think that last statement, it's not a bless me club, but when I read that, I think of John 17 immediately in Jesus' high priestly prayer, which is very, very powerful. And he speaks about, Father, that they may be one, even as we are one. And out of that, there's an incredible, powerful thing in there that grips me that I don't understand. But he said, in that oneness, the world will believe you sent me. There's something supernatural that goes out in the unity, not just I'm not talking about ecumenical unity, I'm talking about unity of the spirit, the heart, that connects us together, the body of Christ, and we're the greatest power on the earth to be reckoned with. So I heard someone else say, I've heard a lot of people say a lot of stuff, but some things I hang on to. I heard somebody else say, how big is the internal space in your life to carry a dream. How big is the internal space in your life to carry a dream? See, God gave every one of us a dream. Right back in the beginning with Adam and Eve, you know, we know the story. In Genesis 1, it tells us really God got them together and he said to them, be fruitful and multiply, 
really replenish the earth, subdue it. What did that mean? They didn't have anybody else to go by. Be fruitful and multiply. They are the only two human beings around at that time. Replenish the earth and subdue it. What does that mean? What an incredible dream that God put into their heart back then and yeah, they messed it up, but God didn't mess anything up, thankfully. I may have said this before, but another statement, I'm making a lot of statements, but they stick in me because I, I glean from them and I draw on them at times when pressures come. And T.L. Osborne, anybody ever heard of T.L. Osborne? A couple of hands. I heard him many, many, many years ago make a statement. He said, you'll find power for your hour when you esteem God's dream. Always stuck in my heart. You'll find power for your hour when you esteem God's dream. God's got a dream. You know the greatest dream that God's got? His dream was his family, that they have a church without spot and without wrinkle. I don't think there could be a bigger dream than that. And thankfully it's not a daydream. It's going to happen. So the thing is that I've also discovered, I've discovered a few things on the journey, that uh, life can shrink the dream-carrying space. Life can shrink it. Life is what happens when you've got other things planned. You know, smoking, if you know anything about smoking, I'm not here to give a lecture on smoking, obviously, but smoking, if you do enough of it, it can shrink your lungs. Emphysema can be an outcome of a lot of smoking. And uh, so lungs shrink, and if lungs shrink, you don't get the same capacity for breathing and air. And so life can shrink this space on the inside of every one of us to carry a dream that God's given to us. And sometimes dreams get knocked about. So my basis for all of this is Romans 8 verse 28. And I'm, I'm sharing, I mess up the guys at the back. I guess I'm sharing out of the voice. I'm sorry, and I never gave anybody any scriptures. My apology. Um, I've, I've, as I said, I've been reading The Voice now for a number of years and I love it, so it touches my heart, so you'll have to put up with it today. So if you've got a new King James Version, it won't quite say the same. But Romans 8.28 says in my Bible, we are confident, just say that for a minute, we are confident that God is able, that God is able. We're confident that God is able to orchestrate everything to work towards something good and beautiful when we love him and, I don't know a whole lot of English, but I know and is a conjunction, and it joins two statements together. When we love him and we accept his invitation to live according to his plan. Now the New King James Version simply says we're called according to his purpose. My Bible says to live according to his plan. So God's able to do everything, orchestrate everything towards something good and beautiful, one, when we love him, two, and live according to his plan or that accept that invitation. So invitations, you know, invitations are an interesting thing. And in honesty, I'm not bagging ministers, obviously, but over the years in my involvement really with a lot of ministers and where there's been gatherings together and an invitation, ministers are obviously the worst in the world for giving RSVPs. They're shocking. You've got to chase them up all the time, ring, whatever, I don't know, what anyway, they, they are, I'm too busy. But with an invitation, there's always an RSVP, there's a response. Has to be. What time the thing is, you know, where it is, when are you coming, you're not coming. So all those things and then there's always instructions too with invitations. You know, if you're going here, you need to park in this area, really, uh, and you come through the doors at the back and whatever. So invitations and instructions, very much a part of all of our life. And uh, for my basis on this, I'm going back to Joshua chapter 5. Wonderful book uh, that I've been reading for some time. And I'm just going to go through some chapters uh, because obviously I want to get to a place, and uh, if I stick with what I'm doing, I'll get to the place. In Joshua chapter 5, and we, we know the story about this, but it says in verse 13, now Joshua, when Joshua was traveling near the city of Jericho, he saw a man standing in front of him with a sword drawn and ready. 
And, and I mean, that says something, obviously, right now. See, I don't know, some who know more than I do, which would probably be a lot of you, I don't know whether Joshua had any sword on. I don't know whether he dressed for any battle or whatever. He was out checking things out, really. But all of a sudden, there's a man standing in front of him with a sword drawn. It wasn't in the scabbard. It was out, drawn and ready. And uh, Joshua stepping toward him. Very courageous, this man, Joshua. He said, are you one of us or are you one of our enemies? Good question. Are you for us or are you against us? That's not a bad question to sort of tuck away in your heart. I'm not talking about suspicion, but all I know is my Bible tells me try the Spirit, see what sort they're of. So are you for us? And he said, no. That's a great answer, isn't it? I'm neither one of them. I'm here as the commander of the Eternal's army. I often I try to picture the, what, what would have run through Joshua at that point in time. He's got a man standing there, he's got a sword in his hand, he's standing there, and Joshua steps toward him like, all right, mate, uh, who are you? Well, I'm actually the commander of the Lord's army. Oh. He didn't just step back, he actually fell on his face. And then he asked a really good question. What is your command for your servant, my Lord? Good question. What's your command? Not now what I've got in my mind and what I'm going to do and I was going to do this and I was going to have a go at you and whatever else, but what really you've got to say is the most important thing I can hear right now. That is on the ground. And simply the statement is, which blows me away a bit, take your sandals off if you're on holy ground. You know what that says to me in my heart as I read that? It says, before you walk and you warfare, worship. Your worship comes before your walk daily and your warfare. You get in touch with him. You're the reason we're here, to encounter your love. Your love surrounds us. And if that happens, if we connect with that first, and then we start to walk in our daily walk with the Lord, and if there's warfare, we're equipped to carry that out as well. So a very important thing as I look at this to me anyway, and I see this, and as I said, they're all invitations and instructions. Uh, Joshua could have just pressed on and, and done what he was doing and said, oh, I've got a plan and I'm going on. I'm shooting across to Joshua chapter 7. He said, I just want to touch on some things. You know what happened in Jericho. I'm sure everybody in this room probably knows what happened in Jericho really where they marched around an eight-acre block really uh, once a day for six days and then they marched around seven times on the seventh day and then they had an incredible plan, didn't they? Very strategic plan. When you get around that time, everybody shout at the top of your voice because you've got to keep your mouth shut up until that point in time. I reckon that was a miracle. Can you imagine a heap of Israelites and army and everything else marching around once a, once a day for six days? Nobody's saying anything. No wonder they shouted. At the end of that seventh day, they shouted, and, and the word was, you do that, and the priests are going to blow the shofars, and the walls are going to come down. I mean, that, does that blow your mind or what? I mean, uh, gee, God, help me. But anyway, that's what they did. They followed that through. And of course, the greatest miracle in all of that is Rahab, Rahab the harlot. How many times did she get mentioned through the book? Rahab the harlot. How significant was her life? And her house is on the back of the wall, and all the walls come down, but her house and everybody in it stays intact. That's a miracle. And I love that because, again, my mind goes immediately to Exodus 12, which says the lamb was slain for the household. Take the whole household into the house. Everybody in that household, whether they were visitors or whatever, they were all safe. Salvation met with them. Very, very special. Anyway, so moving on. In chapter 7 it says right in the first verse, but the Israelites acted unfaithfully in one thing. Sometimes God just reminds you of just one thing, but I mean, it's only one thing. I mean, not one thing's not all that terribly important, surely, goodness. But they acted unfaithfully in 
one thing. They didn't allow everything from Jericho to be destroyed as God had ordered. But God's got a plan, hasn't he? And, and really he sets his plan up so that within that plan, it's not heavy, it's not religious, it's not really we're intimidated or pushed down or squashed or squeezed, really we're sons and daughters of God. But he's got a plan. And one thing, and the one thing that unfolds out of this, as they were told, I'll read it actually in the chapter prior, chapter 6. Be sure to stay away from these things that he's devoted to complete destruction God has devoted to, so that you won't be tempted to pick, pick up something and carry it away. Anyone who disobeys God in this matter will bring destruction on all of us. Gee, one thing, one man one circumstance and the consequences touch the whole community. Quite incredible, isn't it? Quite powerful. Because the man's name was Achan, and Achan saw some stuff, and uh, he decided that really he was going to retain it. And uh, so after that happened, these guys are going to go up to Ai. It's a nice city that they're going to conquer. They have a look at it and say, oh, look, we don't really need too many guys here. We can do this on our own. Just two or three thousand will do. Two or three thousand go up. They're routed. Thirty-six are killed, and they're devastated. They can't believe after Jer uh, Jericho, how could this be? And so they did something very good. They fell on their faces in the presence of God, or the covenant chest was there. They fell on their faces, put dust on their heads, and they re remained there until evening. And Joshua then asked why. How many times do you ask why? You ask God why? I've asked God why a thousand times. Why? Why did that happen? Why didn't they do that? Why didn't someone tell me that? Why didn't they say, you know, it's interesting the whys, isn't it? Why, eternal one, O Lord, why have you brought us across the Jordan if only to let the Amorites destroy us? Would have been better for us to settle on the other side of the Jordan Lord, how am I going to explain that our fighting men have had to run for their lives? The people of Cain and all the inhabitants of this land will hear that we've been defeated. They'll surround us and destroy us as a people forever. And then how will, we, how will the world remember your great name? I thought that was a very, very good response right at the end of everything that said why. How will the world remember your great name? You know, if you're looking at me and I'm looking at you and you're looking at the person beside you, we're the only evidence as well as the body of Christ that says God remains. The only evidence on this planet that still says God's alive. He's not dead. And he's doing what he's doing. And he's loving and saving and redeeming and healing and delivering. We're the evidence. So God then says simply, get up. What are you doing in the dirt? I mean, that would have shocked them a bit. Either. We're, re we're repenting, something terrible has happened, and God just says, get up, get out of the dirt. There's a simple explanation, Israel has sinned. Boy, what a simple thing. A simple thing, Israel sinned, one man sinned. But God says, because his people were called upon to respond and follow his plan, he says, all sin, the consequence touched everyone's life. Goes on further down in that same chapter, and he said, you'll not be able to resist your enemies unless you remove the banned items from among you. One man's choice has an impact upon everyone. In verse 20 of that chapter, it says, it's true, Achan speaking, I'm the one who broke the commandment of the eternal God of Israel. Among all the spoils of the city, I found a beautiful Babylonian robe, five pounds of silver, 20 ounces of gold. When I saw them, I wanted them, and I took them. I wonder what runs through your mind when I say that. Immediately when I read those things, my mind goes back to Genesis 3. A man and a woman in a garden. And somebody had said to them, namely God, you can eat from everything in here but you can't eat from that tree, the knowledge of good and evil. It's like God said to the first couple, I'm giving you a million dollars, but I want to keep five cents. And it's that tree over there. But the trouble is, and it says it in the book, she said, when I looked at the tree, 
there's a tree to be desired to make one wise and I took and I ate. Very careful in it. Really, Job says in his writings, he said, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look on a maid as it's a man. But our eyes, say, can get us into all sorts of trouble and we look, we see things and they grab us and we want them and we go after them and they consume our whole thinking and motivation. So that's what he said. I wanted them, I took them. They're buried now on the ground inside my tent with the silver at the very bottom of the hole. <clears throat> Verse 25 then tells us the outcome of this, the consequences of the choice. People stoned Achan and his family, burned them and all their belongings, and afterward they erected a pile of stones over Achan that still stands today. When all of this was done, the Eternal put away his anger. anger. So to this day, that place is called the Valley of Achor, which means trouble, because his name actually means troublesome. Fascinating in the Word of God, isn't it, really, when you look at biblical names, what the real meaning is attached to them. So here's a man with a troublesome name and probably carrying that all his life to whatever age, really, on the inside of him, he reacted and he was troublesome and created a consequence that the whole people that he was in amongst. Chapter 8 says this, don't be afraid or discouraged. If you read chapter 1 of Genesis, you see that four times. God says to Joshua back there, don't be afraid, be strong, don't be courageous. The repeated thing, be strong, be, be courageous, don't be discouraged. So God says again, don't be afraid or discouraged. Take all your fighters up to Ai, watch. I'll hand over the king of Ai, his, his people, his city, the land to you. You'll do to Ai exactly as you did to Jericho and his king, except you may keep only the cattle and spoil for yourselves. So there's a proviso there. And I, I'm interested when I see the grace of God in the Old Testament, that God's grace flows in in spite of what's been going on. So that's what happens there. They go up, take 30,000 men this time, and the whole place is routed very, very powerfully. And in verse 24 of that chapter, it says this, when the last of Ai's men in the field and wilderness had been killed by the sword, the Israelites returned to Ai and killed everyone inside the city. Man, when you read the Old Testament, I mean, it's a bloodthirsty book. But God was really emphasizing, hey, you touch that, you get involved with that, there'll be mixture and it will ruin your life. It, it's not a hard thing, but it's just very clear, isn't it? God sort of made it very clear. Uh, the Israelites returned, they killed everyone inside the city, 12,000 fell that day. I'm so grateful, man, I was born in 1939. This was a heavy day to be involved in here. Man, killing wasn't just men and women, it was children, it was everything. It destroyed everything. Thank God for the grace of God. 12,000 fell, men and women, all the people of Aaron, for Joshua did not lower his javelin until the destruction was complete. That's something, hey. He was leading the way. And he kept that javelin up there until the victory was complete. He never put it down once. The power that's involved in leadership. Okay, so I'm pressing on. Uh, at the end of that chapter, I love it, when they, they built an altar, again they worship. First thing after the victory, they worship. Everybody came together and they worship, just as Moses had instructed. And it says, as it goes on there, uh, so that the people could be blessed, Joshua read out all the words of the law, blessings and curses alike, every word written, every word that Moses had commanded, Joshua read to the men, women and children of Israel and to the sojourners re residing among them. Out of that, the whole community heard the word. I mean, how long did that take? He read all the words of the law. Men, women, and children, everybody was gathered together there, both the blessings and the curses, so they knew which way to go. God had said, I hey, choose this day who you're going to serve. You're going to go that way, you're going to go that way. This is the benefits, they're the consequences. So he, he never hid anything from us. Okay, chapter 9, it says the kings of the land, they got word of what was going on, and uh, they unified to oppose Joshua and Israel. 
But the people of Gibeon, who were Hivites, had a different idea when they heard what Joshua had done. They decided to use their wits, not their military might. I, I love those things that are in the book. There's a little verse in Ecclesiastes 9, I think it's verse 8, it says wisdom is better than weapons of war. You know, there's times where you can avoid warfare. And James 1.5 says if we lack wisdom, godly wisdom, ask God, he's got heaps of it, and he'll give it to us liberally if we don't doubt his willingness to give it. David, I think it's in 1 Samuel 21, I don't know, I might have missed that there, but David at one time is before Achis, the king, and word had got out who he was. At that time he had acceptance, but then word had got out, you know, this, this is David, you know, he's amongst this Philistine group here, he's a problem. You know what David did? It says that he scratched on the gate of the city and dribbled down his beard. And the king looked at him and said, no room around here for nuts, get him out of here. He saved his life, but not only his life, he saved heaps of other lives. By well, just doing something that seems so dumb. But wisdom, hey, godly wisdom sometimes avoids a lot of heartache on the way. Someone prophesied over many, many years ago, and I know they asked me a question. They said, do you listen to your wife? I had a big answer to that. Huh? But I said, I would most never said a word. <laughs> but I better shut my mouth. And he went on to say, she'll save you a lot of wear and tear and miles. Now, I'm not sure whether that prophecy has come true yet, but anyway, well, that was the word. So I took it on board. I thought, okay, I'm going to listen to my wife, and if I get sick of listening, I'll walk away. Uh, a wise man's always got an answer. Anyway, praise God. So these guys here, they, they, they're smart. They're going to use their wits, and uh, they got dressed in threadbare clothes, the food they carried was dry and mouldy as though they'd come from a long distance. And uh, they came and said, look, we beg you to make a treaty with us. Now, God had already told them back in Deuteronomy not to make any treaties with anybody. But make a treaty. And uh, the Israelites say, well, how can we make a treaty with you? This is in verse 7. How do we know you aren't from around here? Joshua, they all say to Joshua, we're your servants. He says, who are you? Where do you come from? And they tell this great porky. Now, God's not into porkies, obviously, but they tell this great porky, really, that we've come, look, you can see that our bread, it was fresh when we started off, and now it's moldy and dry and whatever else. See our sandals are hanging in threads of our feet. Our clothes are falling to bits on us. We've come a long way now. They said that you can see we've traveled a very long way. Then it says in the next verse, man, there's little things in there, and it says the leaders did not consult the eternal. Dangerous stuff, isn't it? We press on. No? We're right. We've got the plan. We'll just go for it. We didn't bother about asking God, God, what do you think about this whole situation? Anyway, God in his grace allowed them to form a treaty with these people, and they became their servants cut wood for them and everything else. And God, again, as I say, his grace really was upon the whole thing. Chapter 10, we get to chapter 10. There's a lot of stuff going on. There's kings that are rising against Joshua. And uh, they said there, let's band together and destroy Gibeon now. And we'll become allies to these invaders and Joshua and the Israelites. And these five kings of the Amorites gathered their forces came down upon the city of Gibeon like a mighty wave. And the Gibeons saw this and they sent word to Joshua. So Joshua then had to pick up another responsibility because he sort of never checked it out back there. Now he's also got the Gibeonites, the Hivites, to look after as well and defend them. Because he'd made the treaty, he said, okay, we'll come down there and we'll defend you. Joshua comes down, the eternal one again says to Joshua, don't be afraid of the Amorites. Like Jericho and Ai, I'm delivering these armies into your hands. None of them will be able to stand against you. Joshua surprised them, having marched his men all night from Gilgal and the Eternal. You know that God's got his own weapons. 
And I, I am fascinated. We, I know God's given us weapons. 2 Corinthians 10 tells us the weapons of our warfare are mighty in God, pulling down strongholds. But God's got his own weapons, and it says them in here, God caused fear and confusion. He defeated the enemy right at his own game. Who often comes with fear and confusion. God's got greater fear and confusion. And then it goes on, and this bit I love. I mean, I, love, I hope there's a video of this when we get to heaven. It says, He hurled huge and deadly hailstones upon them from heaven. And more of the Amorites were killed by God's hailstones than by the people of Israel on that day. Can you imagine that? God said, Okay, boys, open up the cabinet over there that's got the hailstones in it, the big ones, the deadly ones. <coughs> You know, an amazing picture. I mean, it blows me away. I think if God be for us, and Neil quotes it, if God be for us, who can be against us? Just remember, he's got hailstones. If all else failed, hailstones. I think it's great anyway. I love it. So there's a whole recorded event here that leads to an extraordinary example of God's desire to reveal himself to the humanity he loves. And uh, I'm going to go back to something that I hadn't thought of for many, many years, actually, and I'd researched it years ago. That was actually through NASA, the American Space Station Agency, and Cape Canaveral. And when they're doing space uh, flights, they feed into the computers and check in the trajectory that they're going to go on where planets and everything else is moving around in the heavenlies. And so when they fed this, in the 20th century this happened, when they fed the information into computers, the amazing thing was they came up with a day missing. A day. Now let me read verse 12 when I'm talking about God throwing hailstones down. Verse 12 says, On the day of the Eternal's great slaughter, Joshua consulted with the Eternal One, and then in front of all the people of Israel, he commanded the sun and moon, Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and moon, remain over the valley of Agilon. You notice that Joshua consulted with the Eternal One and then spoke. And because we live in a day where we know really that the earth orbits the sun, not vice versa. But he commands the sun to stand still and the moon to remain over the valley of Agilon. The fascinating thing with that is that when they checked that out in the computers and they found this day, oh, I should read that, sorry. In verse 13 it says, The sun stood still in the heavens and the moon did likewise, so the battle could continue until the Israelites had destroyed their enemies just as it was written in the scroll of Jasher. The sun stalled in the sky for almost an entire day before it set. There has never been another day like this before or since when the Eternal so answered a person's prayer for the Eternal thought for the people of Israel. So they discovered, and there was a Christian, the reason that they really discovered that there was a Christian in amongst the scientists that were doing this work and remembered an old Bible story. And they came back to Joshua chapter 10. And they read that about the sun stood still for almost a day, but there were still 20 minutes missing. So they dug around, prayed, this guy prayed, sought the Lord, and remembered another story in 2 Kings chapter 20. It says this, At this time Hezekiah was deathly sick. And God sent Isaiah the prophet to him. You don't want a prophet coming with this message. You're not going to recover, you're going to die. And Hezekiah faced the world, well, faced the, he didn't hit the wall. Big difference between facing the wall and hitting the wall. He faced the wall and began to pray to the eternal. You know, again, I suppose I think about in my life, how big is the eternal space in me to carry a dream? How far? Will I carry the dream that's in the, How far will you carry the dream that's in that space inside you? And what sort of adversities or circumstances or pressures will come against you to try and shrink that space? 
on the inside of your life. So Hezekiah faced the wall and he begins to pray. What a, what a great prayer. Isn't it good to be able to remind God that you're not perfect, but you really sought to be faithful to him? He said, I beg you to remember I've lived in faithfulness, given my heart to you and have practiced goodness before your eyes. Now it's not goodness for us, it's righteousness. We seek to live righteously in the righteousness that Jesus has given to us. Hezekiah was truly distraught and wept bitterly. But before Isaiah got away, God spoke to him again and said, Go back. Tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, this is the message of the Eternal One, the God of your ancestor David. I've listened to your prayer and I've witnessed the tears falling down your face. You know, God hears our pleas and he sees our tears. He's not adverse to our feelings and our emotions. You witness the tears falling down your face, therefore I'm going to heal you. I want you to go to the Eternal's Temple on the third day. I'll add 15 years to your life. I'm also going to save you and your city from Assyria's king. I'll fight on behalf of this city in order to preserve my honour and my servant David's honour. I, I love the fact that through the book, you know, a man was here in July, not last year, the year before, and he brought a prophetic word to us as a church. He said, firstly, God is going to visit this people. And he said, God is going to activate the heart of David in this people. And how many times God, through the word, honours David in the things that he does. So bless the Lord, hey, we want that heart, do we? Activate it more and more. So Isaiah says, fetch a lump of figs. Now that doesn't sound very supernatural, does it at all? But I'm thankful we've got a God who sees the natural and the supernatural. Get a lump of figs. Use something that's going to be beneficial. Put that on the saw, and they did that, and it says he was healed. Marvelous. A little bit further on. Hezekiah then, wise man, he said, should I be looking for a sign from the eternal, a sign that tells me he's going to heal me and it's time for me to go to the eternal's temple on the third day? Isaiah said, yes, this is a sign the eternal one will give you to know he will uphold his promise to you. Will the shadow move forward ten steps or retreat ten steps, remembering they deal in sundials and so the shadow is what they follow to work out the time of the day. Hezekiah said, it's nothing special for the shadow to increase ten steps. May the shadow retreat ten steps. Prophet Isaiah called out to the eternal and he caused the shadow on the stairs to retreat ten steps down Ahaz's stairs, which has been designed as a sundial. You know, when they fed that into the computer, it worked out exactly 20 minutes. Today in Joshua, ten, almost a day, and then Hezekiah's condition, 20 minutes, which made up the whole missing day. You know why I'm emphasizing that? You know, we talk about God's plan. When did God plan that situation? God and his full knowledge knew Joshua was going to make a wrong decision. He was going to make a choice, really, that was, could have put things off course. But friend, the good thing is God's plan isn't altered by your and my choices. We can be affected by them, but his plan continues on. And you know where we started this morning, we said we're confident. We are confident. Confidence, not overconfidence. Not confident in, I've had a lot of experience now. You know, I learned a lot of stuff. I've studied a lot of stuff. But I'm confident that God's able. My God, he's my father. He's for me. He's able. When he knows I'm languishing, I'm weakened, whatever. And we sang it this morning. When I'm weak, he strengthens me again. You know, if they're just words of song, say they'll float away and do nothing, but if we embrace what we're singing, man, the reason we came to us encounter your love, your love surrounds us. Man, I've taken that on board. That's real. I live in that. I live out of that. So God's able to orchestrate everything to, be, to work towards something good and beautiful when we love him and accept his invitation to live according to his plan. You know, as I look at the people in the wilderness that came out of there, 
And yes, the men all died in the wilderness. The older men, the older women all died in the wilderness. And if you read through those books of Joshua, you'll find that God spoke to Joshua and said, I want you to circumcise the sons and the grandsons. Because really the evidence of the covenant people got lost back in the wilderness. And so all the sons and the grandsons were circumcised. Again, the evidence of God's covenant people. But you know, the fact that still remains that those people that murmured, complained, and whinged and did everything else, they were necessary to get all those younger ones to the Jordan River to cross over. So you know, God actually said to Joshua, really, I know you're growing old, but there's still work to do. David said it differently in Psalm 71. He said, God, I know I'm growing old and my hair's turning grey, but don't abandon me. Don't put a use by date on me. Thank God there's still work to be done, hey? And so for all of us here, younger, older and everything, there's work to be done. But the good thing is we can be confident that God's able. He's able. He can work all these things towards good and beautiful outcomes when we love him and we accept his invitation to live according to his plan. I just, how am I going? Oh. Hallelujah. I think that clock's wrong. <laughs> My goodness. Time fly. You know, this morning, I, I trust really in our own hearts, hey, obviously my desire is that we simply do take hold of God's plan and continue to live in it and be confident that he is able and he's for us and he's with us and he'll watch over us and he'll take us through and when it's tough, he'll still be there. And he's still got in that space inside of you for that carrying a dream space. It's still there, and if it's shrunk a bit by circumstances of life, just say, God, enlarge. Like Jabez cried, God, enlarge my case. Enlarge it. Hey, can we stand together? I'd just love to pray. This morning, again, if there's areas and issues, challenges, whatever, obviously, I love to stand with people. And Neil would love to pray, I'm sure, but I'd love to stand with people, just agree with you. If you're doing tough, doing stuff, and again, you want to say, God, I just went enter, enter where two of you agree. There's some power in that. So, Father, today as we, as we come to this place, oh God, again, a lot of things, a lot of words, a lot of statements. Father, a lot of truths. And, Lord, we're your people, so you've called on us, Lord, in that accepting the invitation to live according to your plan. Lord, you, you've called us that we might decipher Father Proverbs said, it's the glory of God to conceal something, but it's the honour of kings to search it out. You've called us kings and priests unto yourself. So Lord, help us in our searching out the truths that we need to have resident in our hearts so that that space on the inside of us can be enlarged to carry the dream you've placed there. Father, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.